welcome to the 23rd episode of the 6th season of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday the 31st of July, and in this episode, we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news, and we'll also talk about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark, and joining me this week are the usual suspects, Tony. Good evening. Alan. Hiya. And Laura. Hello. How are we all then? Great. Good. Fantastic. Tony. Is, is there actually any news to talk about? Oh, I'm sure we'll find something. I don't think anything has happened in the there is Especially news. not in the Ubuntu community. There no. is a veritable document full of news. <laughs> Let's get on with document. it then. Really? Okay. Excellent. And here is that news. The United Kingdom government have announced plans to introduce content filtering to block pornography and new internet connections by default. The proposals have compare, been compared with the censorship used by the Chinese government, although the filtering can be disabled by users by phoning up your ISP and saying, I would like the porn, please. <laughs> In fact, well, yeah, it's a bit Alan Partridge, isn't it? Um, yes. <laughs> a bit, yes. The trouble is, it's not, just, it's not even just porn. I mean, it would be bad enough if it was just porn, but it's not even <laughs> just porn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I am outraged. <laughs> not not yeah, because I, I don't yeah, like I people blocking laughing. my porn, more just because I don't like censorship in general. Yes, but yeah. it's um, the Open Rights Group have done some digging and spoken to some ISPs to find out what exactly the government are suggesting they do. Um, and they've got a list of what the form is likely to look like, and it contains categories such as pornography, extremist material which is probably not something which you that want... would cover us, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, it's, it's not something you want your government deciding whether you're allowed to see or not, yeah. because they can just say that anything which they don't like is extremist, yeah. because it's not their Bear. view. Yeah. Um, self-harm websites, um, esoteric material, which I thought was an interesting one. <laughs> that so covers any, your any, music anything, taste. Yeah, anything, porn, which, porn taste. anything which David Cameron doesn't understand. Right. Um, right. Which is the rest Web of Web forums. Internet. That was a great one. Web, web forums. forums. So you can you have web forums blocked by default, apparently. Wow. To what end? To stop people talking. <laughs> well, it's I suppose unbelievable. It, it really it, it is like the Great Firewall of China, you know. Without wishing to, you know, trivialise it, it is ridiculous. <laughs> oh. and but it will save the children. That's the important thing. It will stop child abuse. It will save really. It will save our country's innocence. Hmm. As somebody said, it's a very 1995 way of tackling the problem yeah. is, to, is to stop search engine terms and to block it, you know, block at the ISP. It kind of ignores all of the other ways that these things can happen. Yeah. Do uh, children really look at esoteric material? Is that... It, there's I mean, this thing called um, In the Night Garden. That's pretty esoteric. That's pretty esoteric, yeah. 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 <laughs> if that isn't drug and tell it all this. Well, I remember from my experience working at a secondary school where, where I did introduce internet filtering. Um, well, Tony. It's a very different environment, you have to admit, from every you know, the wide, wide yeah, internet. Sure. Um, but even then, there were lots of false positives that came up. Mm. So you might have a category, say, drugs that is banned. And obviously, there'd be bad sites, for want of a better phrase, that'd be blocked. But also, it turns out it blocks really helpful sites. Drugs you know, where education. Pe- where people genuinely can get drugs education material or, or if they think they've got a drugs problem site, so they might go to look up information about it and how to get right. help. Oh, yeah. So, and it's being run by someone who has history in this, this area, Huawei. Yeah. Who, who are Chinese company who have links to the Chinese government. Yes. Who so are ba- they're the experts. Yes. Yeah. Well, at least we're getting it from the right people, clearly. <laughs> if you're going to buy your, um, you know, your state, censorship state system, <laughs> censorship, get it from the people who really know what they're talking about. Mm, dark mm, times. Turn yes. it off, people. So just say no. Oh, there's petitions all over the place. Um, open rights group is probably the best one to go with. Yes. Mark is eating his My tea. mouth might be full of dinner at the moment. I, I apologise, listeners. I got here late. Join the Open Rights group. <laughs> I think somebody somewhere is going to be editing their article about podcast listings right yeah, now. Yeah, I was thinking that myself. <laughs> More on that story later. <laughs> Just eat your tea. <laughs> Google have announced a couple of new hardware devices. The first is a thinner, lighter and faster version of their Nexus 7 mini tablet. Then there's their new TV streaming dongle available for just 35 of your Earth dollars, which you basically connect into the HDMI socket on your TV and connect it to a wireless network and you can send video to your TV from uh, mobile devices. That's what I thought. And then I looked a bit deeper. 
Oh. You can control it from mobile devices, but what it actually is is Chrome OS on a stick stripped down. Right. No, it's not. It's Android. Is it? Yeah, the thing it's, I not, read said, oh, it's not Chrome. The thing I read said it was Chrome OS. It's, okay. more, it's more like Android than right. Chrome. So it's got Google Play Movies, Netflix, YouTube, and something else, um, mm-hmm. Chrome, right? basically, and you can control it remotely using a mobile device or right. anything with Chrome on it, but you can't send stuff from your device to it. You can only get stuff from the apps that are on it from the web right so i guess if you bought a movie from the google movie store yes on your mobile it would then be available on your chrome cast thing i I can see a a lot of good uses for this yes especially for only 35 dollars it's sitting around Mm. on the sofa sometimes or you know at home i'll have my laptop out Mm. or a phone or something and i'll click a link to a youtube video and i'll say oh that's funny uh, but providing I'm allowed to access that, of course. Yes. Um, it's not and, too esoteric. And um, I'll want to show wife and kids, you know, oh, this is a funny video. And I want to, I do like the idea of being able to press a button and send it to my TV. It has an air of Jack Bauer and 24 yeah. about it. Like, send it to my screen. And actually, you can, you can do this already. You can pair an Android device and your browser. Uh, already so you can actually have a like a desktop pc with a with a big screen Mm. and have your mobile device send the video and tell your your pc and control your pc from your android device this just makes it easier and on the big telly and presumably it won't be too long before somebody hacks it and works out you can do other things with it and but it can we can definitely run a linux kernel Mm. yeah so that's a start yeah (laughs) we'll do tv next i saw on um i fix it they've um torn it apart yeah and uh it wasn't very difficult they just use a plastic Spooger? Yeah. Spudger. 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 That's yeah. definitely a band search term from yeah. Days. Yeah. Plastic spudger uh, to just apprise the thing apart. And there's basically three chips inside one for all the radio stuff, the processor, and some memory. And that's like it. <laughs> and there's not much else inside. Um, Has anybody done um, Will It Blend on it yet? I don't, I, ooh, yeah, I don't know. What's oh. Will It Blend? Well, basically, Will It Blend. It got the <laughs> <Will it> blend <laughs> tech make these really sort of it's super strong now. blenders. Mm. And so there's a guy who makes videos of putting things in a blender, uh, like iPads, glow sticks, uh, matches, you know, to see what will happen. Tin cans and yeah. marks in yeah. 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 yeah it's pretty cool. There we go. Um, John, the nice guy, is listening live and is commenting in our IRC channel. And he says that people have already worked out how to stream desktop and file content to it. Nice. Well, that's so, good then. It's definitely worth $35 in that case. Yeah, 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 totally. If you could get it over here, which you can't. Oh, oh. you can't get the Nexus 7 here yet either. The new no. one. Why are we... Why do we even bother? Because we're not the Ubuntu <laughs> UK podcast anymore. No, right. We're the Ubuntu yeah. podcast. We're global, global Village, global. my friend. Global Village. I need to replace one of you with an American. No. It's been a busy week at Google. They've uh, also released an update to their Android operating system. Version 4.3 includes smarter storage management designed to improve performance and an updated UI for the camera. And it breaks iPlayer. (laughs) And I installed it last night and I actually didn't notice any different other than it was all a wee bit slower. Really? I found... Why did you install it on your Nexus 10? I put it on my Nexus 4 and it's all a wee bit snappier. Mm. Um, Maybe you got my snappy. I did take take a photo (laughs) with it. I did take a photo with it earlier. I didn't notice much difference to the camera UI. Oh, if you press and the Tony showed me the settings used to be in a circle and now they're like a oh yes, yeah, so they are arcs, in a little and then arc. you move outwards yes. through the arcs. Yeah, I still don't um, like pinch to zoom on a camera. It doesn't make any sense to me. Right. Anyway, it makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> I'm ambivalent. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Just trying to like, you know break the deadlock there. <laughs> Uh, hosting company DigitalOcean has caused a security issue for its customers who run Ubuntu systems. The server images deployed in their cloud were not creating new host keys, meaning they could be vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. How could they be vulnerable? How is that possible? Because you can't be sure that the server you're connecting to is the server that you set up. So so if I I set up a machine at DigitalOcean knowing that somebody else had something hosted there and I could spoof someone's DNS and point them at mine, I could... You could pretend to be them and then pass the traffic okay. back into the real So server, basically they had that? they had an image with a key set up and they were just yeah. cloning that image rather than setting up That's... a fresh image and making a key. And it's a schoolboy could... error, isn't it? And there could be a woman in the middle who's stopping it all. Yes. <laughs> Good old Alice. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, this was a schoolboy error. Yeah. And it's kind of made the news and they've acknowledged it and uh, they're fixing their processes. Um, but interestingly, it's um, I saw a, a comment on Hacker News about this that... Um, it's a it's potentially a trademark issue because they're 
saying that they're Ubuntu images, but they're not ones that were created by Canonical. Mm. They're not f- official, in inverted commas, images. And by doing something like that, it potentially taints the image of Ubuntu because it makes out like Ubuntu is uh. a kind of system where uh. you could have host keys which are yeah. uh, vulnerable I, like this. I see a, uh, a lawsuit coming which may have the value of about $25 million. <laughs> <laughs> Here's hoping. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. More on that later. <laughs> I think they're just going to be told, hey, you might want to change that. And <laughs> Yeah. Right, fair enough. Mm. And the next story. Uh, Bradley Manning, the US soldier who leaked thousands of military messages and videos to WikiLeaks, has been found guilty of 20 charges, but not the most serious, of aiding the enemy. Manning, who spent most of his time in prison in solitary confinement, will find out his sentence soon, which could be up to a million years. (laughs) Oh, sorry, 130 years. Well, that sounds sensible and proportional. Uh, Yes. Absolutely. Uh, It's an interesting time for whistleblowers in the United States, what with the Edward Snowden... He's not a whistleblower, he's a traitor. Exactly, Apparently, Um, Particularly with the Edward Snowden thing as well, which is another um, case of internal secrets being leaked, arguably for the better good. Mm. Um, Well, apparently opinion on Bradley Manning, anyway, opinion is split in America. So it's not Mm. like a... It's not like everyone in America thinks he's a traitor and everybody outside goes, yeah, it's open. Um, it seems to be quite a split in, within the country as well. I think the same is of um, Snowden as yeah. well. Yeah, in fact, they, did, they had a, a debate in, I believe, the House of Representatives regarding whether, in light of what Snowden revealed, they should review the NSA. And it was defeated, but only narrowly. Oh, right. It was sort of 200 and a bit versus 200 and a bit. Yeah. And apparently the, the uh, law that Bradley Manning has been prosecuted under and now convicted of is the first time it's been used in about 100 years. Oh, good. Oh, um, and it was designed for like actual spies, like James Bond type <laughs> spies. Um, yeah, Trend the, spies. Yeah, he's the first person to be convicted for it, with using that law for ages. It is unfortunate that someone who's made such a dramatic change to the security landscape and the... Um, the relationships between countries in the world ends up, you know, incarcerated for the rest of his life. Yes. Especially when the president of his country goes and uh, tells everyone how great Nelson Mandela was. Well, yes, indeed. Maybe we'll see free Bradley Manning songs coming out in (laughs) 20 years. Who knows? Yeah, the sales figures uh, for Microsoft Surface, the Redmond company's tablet, are in and they're not good. In fact, they're bad. Um, they spent as much advertising the device as they made from selling it, about Ooh. $900 million. Wow. So is this, is this all... Is, this isn't just the, the, the rubbish one. Which the Surface they, RT. It's the Surface Pro as well. It, wow. It's all Ooh. of the Surface. Oh, dear. That's a real shame because it's, it's, really long nice, to one. it's really nice hardware. Yeah. It's, it's, mm. you know, it's, it's a nice idea to have a little pop-up. You know, it doesn't necessarily. It wasn't necessarily implemented brilliantly with the little kickstand thing. Makes it hard to use on your lap or on a plane or something like that. But um, it is nice. There are some nice ideas in there, and it's a nice to have competition with, you know, the incumbent tablet that everyone uses, which is you know the iPad. Um, but isn't that the Nexus Ten? Or the Nexus? That's an alternative. It's good to have lots of alternatives, isn't it? It is, and not just one. And the thing about the Surface is the keyboard it docks into the keyboard doesn't it yeah so you've got that more solid thing and a friend i've got really likes it because it's a bit more uh optimized for content production rather than just watching right yeah and um, because of that yeah well it's a bit like the um the transformer the asus yeah. transformer that, yeah. that we played around with that you know docks and has but i mean i think the transformer was better in some ways because it had a battery in the keyboard which yeah. this does and it was a bit more symmetrical as well because and both solid. parts are about the same yeah whereas on true. the surface the keyboard is really really thin and the tablet bit is really really chunky by comparison to other tablets yeah well lots of people are seeing this as another death knell for microsoft um given the issues they've had with uh, the windows 8 operating system as well yeah. so we shall watch this space and see what happens laura Intel have released their open source PC called Minnow Board. It's basically a motherboard and a few sockets, a bit like a Raspberry Pi. 
but it's got a one gigahertz Atom CPU, one gigabyte RAM and storage on micro SD. It's just $199. So when they're saying open source, it's written here in uh, in air quotes. Tony, what does that Is, mean? It, do they actually mean that it's like open hardware or it will run open source software? I think the uh, the hardware is open. Ooh. It ships good. it ships with Angstrom Linux. Okay. Um and all of the software obviously provided with the source code mm. and stuff. So it's open source in terms of software. Yeah. Um and as far as I know, it's not that open source in terms of the hardware, but I might be wrong. Uh it's it develops between Intel and a company called Circuit Co Electronics and they specialise in open source motherboards. Okay. To what end? Uh I don't know actually. Um I don't know whether this is designed to be uh, an alternative to the Raspberry Pis and the BeagleBoards and the um, Arduinos of the world for Intel to get, you know, low power, low cost, yeah. you know, devices into research and uh, education. I'm not quite sure why they're doing it, to be honest. But it's good. Yeah. Okay. And that's the end of the news. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that tickles, titillates, or taunts you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. We really would like to hear from you, so go on, do your duty, keep calm, and compose an email. It's time for the community news, and it's been a big week for the Ubuntu community. One of the uh, first things that we're going to talk about is the fact that the Ubuntu forums were hacked and Mm. compromised and defaced and then disappeared off the net for a week. (laughs) Well, yeah, they were shut down uh, after they were defaced and, yeah, someone had hacked hacked them and uh, Canonical IS were told and they shut it down. Well, they blocked off internet access while they researched uh, what had happened mm. uh, so yeah the, the forums disappeared they put up a basic page that said you know what's going on that they're looking into it um, and just today uh, it's back up or maybe late last night it's back up uh, with a post-mortem written by James Troop from Canonical IS with details pretty good details of uh, what they did and communication mm. they had with the uh, the software provider and uh, how they investigated and how they're going to change things, what they've learned from it. Um, yes, it's quite an interesting write-up. And the good news is that although they think the hacker had access to all of the hashed and salted passwords of all the forums users, 1.8 million accounts or something, mm. um, they they didn't essentially compromise anything else in the Ubuntu infrastructure. Yeah, and uh, that all seems secure. So it was just the forums. Yeah, it's kind of, forums have always been kind of a siloed away from everything else. Yeah. Um, but now they're going to use the the revised, a souped-up security version has the single sign-on, so use the Launchpad ID for that. Yeah, so, well, it's not, it's technically, it's not your Launchpad ID. I mean, if you originally signed up on Launchpad, it, it is. It is. But um, if you go to, it's, it's called um, Ubuntu single sign-on, yeah. Ubuntu SSO. If you go to login.ubuntu.com, it's that login that you use there mm. that you're used to authenticate on the forums. And it gives you all details in that So is that post. also what you use on Ubuntu One and Ubuntu yeah. Software Center for buying stuff? Yes, yes. exactly. The, the key being single, in yes. a single sign-on, yes. Good. But it looks like it's a combination of a compromised moderator's account who then socially engineered... The, the administrator, former administrators to look at a dodgy page which then had some cross-site scripting in it which enabled them to hijack the session and Clever. basically from there they could do anything they liked with yeah. the forums at least um so a very simple uh compromise in some ways yeah and as a precaution uh Loads of people have uh, lost their moderator account, including me. <laughs> <laughs> I, you... um, I'm pretty sure I wasn't the one that was compromised. But, yeah. yeah, you never know. The nameless moderator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think they're slowly adding more moderators back in, but they've you know reduced it down to a small set of people so that they can um, you know add people systematically. Trusted and, people. Yeah, trusted but people. But you weren't in that tranche, that first tranche of no, people being because I'm re-added. not a forums moderator and I hate forums. So, uh, no. right. so did, did we <laughs> see... So it was it you? I hate going oh. off to sabotage. <laughs> yeah. you, try, you were trying to send it's, people over to Ubuntu it, Discourse, Yeah, you? it's funny. There was, a, there was a few people who were like, hang on a minute, there's these guys at Canonical who've been promoting Discourse as an alternative to forums. Then the forums gets hacked and goes down and they <laughs> tell everyone to go to Discourse. <laughs> <laughs> mm, tinfoil hat. Yes. Well, I, I don't... I don't 
actually go to the Ubuntu forums very often, usually from Googling, and yeah. I happened to be searching for bugs this week, so it was really frustrating getting the search uh, results saying, the answer to your problem is here. Then you click it and you get the page saying, we're not here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's all fixed now, though. It's good. Ubuntu forums has a cup of tea and cake. Yes. Um, so... There's not been much else on us, there. Eh? Oh, oh no, just no. a tiny bit of news. No, nah. what's that? Uh, so we've announced a crowdfunding campaign to build Ooh. a premium smartphone to run Ubuntu called the Edge. Ooh. The Ubuntu Edge. Yes. That name sounds familiar. Well, where have we heard about that before? I think we oh, mentioned yeah. last in a couple of episodes ago that somebody had found out that Canonical had registered oh, Ubuntu yeah. Edge oh, as a yes. trademark. That's right. And I seem to remember. Paul kept a very, very straight face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was his I ain't saying nothing face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was sworn to secrecy. It's Sorry. a good thing That's we not... didn't have Google Hangout on. <laughs> yeah. It's not a face we see very often, to be <laughs> honest. So, yeah, someone found some, uh, the, the domain had been registered and there were some yeah. images found online on the Friday, and then on the Monday it was announced that there was a crowdfunding campaign. Um, so, uh, and you were in, you were at OSCON, weren't you? You were pimping yes. it at OSCON. <laughs> yes, uh, last week I was at OSCON uh, on the Ubuntu community booth, uh, being a booth babe, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> um, along with a whole bunch of people from the community. So, um, Jono was over there, he was on the stand some of the time, but he was also giving talks and running sessions, so he wasn't around for the whole time. Uh, ben Carenza from the local community support team. Who we've interviewed on this show. We recently. have indeed, and uh, he organised, mobilised a bunch of people from the local loco, and Phil Ballou from another loco flew in, um, and uh, so we had a whole bunch of people covering the stand, giving demos of Ubuntu Touch uh, develop a preview on Nexus 4s, right. a whole bunch of those for people to look at and play with, and um, also the uh, hardware preview of the um, Ubuntu Edge handset that we were showing people as well. So, so how did it go down? Yeah, it was really good. It was really madly busy, um, you know, standing up three days, like talking constantly, giving demos over and over and over again <laughs> uh, to, you know, everyone who dropped by. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was interesting because if for those who haven't seen the campaign, which I find incredulous, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're trying to raise 32 million to make the Ubuntu edge over a 30 day period via Indiegogo. Um, I think we're now at 7.59 million. So my laptop tells me, um, and we've got 20 something days to go. So there was a massive response initially, and it mm. made a million dollars in the first two or three hours or something like that. Yeah, it broke a load of records on Indiegogo. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, 32 cool. million is the largest crowdfunding thing ever. Yeah. Um, so it's quite ambitious, and broadly it's a million a day that they need to raise. Yeah. So they were ahead of the curve for a while, um, and it now seems to have plateaued a little bit. Yeah, so the first day there was a couple of discounted um, perks. Mm. Uh, so you, know, you back... Uh, to a certain amount like the the earliest one was six hundred dollars and that was a heavily discounted one from the the standard price which is eight hundred and thirty dollars so you back the project for say six hundred dollars and you get a phone and you get rewarded of a phone yeah. if we end up making it yeah the only way we'll end up making it is if we make the 32 million if we don't make the 32 million uh by the end of the campaign we'll refund everyone's money and we're not making the phone right but it will be available on other handsets? So Ubuntu Touch Preview is already available for download that you can flash onto devices, Nexus devices, and has also been ported by some awesome community people to like 50 other devices. Um, in the future, like pushing aside the edge, uh, we will make Ubuntu Touch available commercially on other phones through other handset providers and through carriers and, and so on. Um, but the edge will only be available to people who back this campaign. If you don't back the campaign, you're not going to get one. It's, the edge isn't going on sale after the campaign finishes. It's only for backers of this campaign. So, eight hundred bucks seems like quite a lot for a phone. What's so special about it? So, it's a premium phone. Uh, it's got fairly decent spec. It's got crazy specs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to play it down a little bit. You know, uh, so quad core, whatever the fastest quad core chip is at the time, will mm. go in it next year. Um, four gig of RAM, minimum four gig of RAM, 128 gig of storage. It's got a sapphire crystal uh, screen. 
which uh, is supposed to be harder than you can have diamonds in your pocket it will scratch it but anything else is okay yeah i, I want to test that yeah. theory and yeah were, everyone were you, said were that. you demoing when you had your hardware demo did you let anyone have a go at it with their keys no because i didn't actually <laughs> think that it was sapphire on the demo oh, right? no. <laughs> the, okay. the demo handset was really just so you get a feel for the weight because it was engineered to be the right weight for the device right. Um, and the look and the feel and where the buttons go and where the connectors are and so, so you can have a feel for it and in fact it was quite nice when you hand it over to someone you show it to them and say look that's what it's going to look like hmm. and they're like ooh I got the same reaction from pretty much everybody as soon as you put it in their hand hmm. it's like ooh I like that and and um, yeah so it's it's quite a decent spec hmm. device hmm. Yeah. Um, the, but the, the, other... the, the, the main unique selling point about it that no other phone does is that when you dock it to a screen, yeah. it turns into a full Ubuntu desktop. So mm. it's the it's the dream that Mark has of the converged device. Yes. Yeah. The well, sort of thing we saw with Ubuntu for Android a little while ago, but it's now running Ubuntu natively on the phone, and you plug it in, and it's an Ubuntu desktop. So the thing about the Edge is it's dual boot. Dual boot, boot yeah. Mm. It'll run Android. So if you've got a legacy set of Android applications, then you can carry on running those on the Edge. You don't have to throw away all your Android apps. You can still run those on the edge. But also it will have Ubuntu for Android so you can plug it into a screen and you've got Ubuntu on your desktop hmm. and then unplug it, walk away, and it's a phone. But it will also have Ubuntu Touch on there as well. So that's the dual boot. It'll, it'll have Android with Ubuntu for Android and Ubuntu Touch with Ubuntu Desktop. So hmm. is there often a bit of an uptick in donations as you reach the end of a crowdfunding thing? Typically, uh, having looked at some of the other crowdfunding campaigns, there's usually um, a peak at the beginning and a peak at the end. Mm. Um, how big those peaks are depends on a huge number of factors. I think this one is particularly tricky because the, the amount we're, we're asking for is so huge. There's also the mm. factor that with Indiegogo, you have to give your money straight away. There's, there's no pledge yeah. your money and if the campaign's successful then you pay it's you pay your money now if it's not successful you get it back yeah which it, means you've got to put 830 dollars up now now yeah or well, well at the moment it's like 775 or something or yes. on day one it was 600 so yeah that's why that peak on the first day there's a there's a nice um uh graph that was done by um one of our engineers uh if you go to ubuntu-edge.info yep. i think yeah. it is um, and you can see the definite like uptick on the first day and then a bit of a plateau. And then when some more things were uh, perks were introduced, it went up again and then it's plateaued mm. again. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to watch. And I know there is a team of people at Canonical who are constantly in talks with people at Indiegogo for how best to progress the, the campaign. Um, and I trust them to do the right thing. So as part of this campaign, Mark Shuttleworth did an ask me anything an AMA on mm. Reddit. Um, and there were lots of questions he didn't answer, um, but there were quite a lot that right. he did, uh, the you know, sensible ones. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, mostly sensible ones. Um, he just read it. Yeah, and uh, it is read it after all. But one of the things that, that people were asking for a lot was they can't afford a phone, they want to help support the campaign. Is there something other than just like a 10 buck donation they can do? So there's now been introduced a pledge option of uh, a T-shirt. Yes. And it's a really nice looking T-shirt. Yeah. yeah, with the old stripes on it. Yeah, the new stripes. I think well, you're fine. Yeah, it's all to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for a fifty dollar pledge, you can get hold of an Ubuntu Edge T-shirt and, and back the project, the and back the project, and yeah. hopefully make it happen. Yeah, because I can't afford one, but I really, really want it to happen. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people in that position. I mean, we're we're fortunate in that there are some people who've who've thrown in way over what they need to. Mm. Like, uh, there's I think there's five backers now who've put in ten thousand mm. um, dollars, and they're only going to get one phone. For that ten thousand, it, it is one of them oh, under uh, the pseudonym M Shuttleworth. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it's, it's a good question because a lot of people are saying, "Well, why doesn't Mark Shuttleworth just put the money up?" Yeah, and, and that make I mean, I, I can completely understand why people ask that question, and I've been asked it a lot over the last <laughs> few days. And the real reason is it makes no sense for Mark to just finance it hmm. because what you end up with is just like any other product, someone who uses their vision to create something that may or may not sell into 
uh, to a market, whether mm. we know or not whether it exists. Mm. Whereas if you put it on a crowdfunding site, you get thousands of people, and we've had thousands, I don't, I think it's 15,000 people who've backed it, which gives us some kind of credibility and says, okay, then maybe this is a good idea. Let's make this device because there are thousands of people out there who want to, to have it. It also, as well as that, gives us something to go to the carriers and the mm. ODMs and the OEMs with and say, look, you know, you're telling us that, that you want an alternative to Android. Here it is. And look, there are thousands of people who will, who will buy it or who are interested in an alternative to Android. And if Mark had just funded it all himself, he'd end up with 10,000 handsets in his garage <laughs> that, that people perhaps didn't want yeah. to buy. That's the other thing. Whereas here, you know that you there's know that yeah. people audience want them, there yes. for exactly, them. Exactly, exactly. And it, and it may well be that we get, you know, some people come along who are, uh, you know, benevolent and, hmm. and throw a bag of money at it more than they need to, you know. I mean, there are, there is one perk on there for $80,000 where you can get 100 phones. You know, someone throws that in. Yeah. That gets us a lot closer to our goal. It's, it's undoubtedly done its job of getting Ubuntu publicity and uh, Jane, the CEO of Canonicals, on CNN or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's been on BBC News well, yeah. in the Sun. Yeah, it's been on the Telegraph, yeah. the Guardian, <laughs> everywhere in the Sun. Yeah, you know. So well. it's definitely got some publicity for Ubuntu, which is all yeah. good stuff. So actually, it's a win-win-win. You know, yeah. If, if we if we end up getting to the 32 million in 30 days, we make an Ubuntu Edge, which is an awesome phone. Great, we win. If we get yeah. to 30 days and we don't hit 32 million, then we've got thousands of people who say, I want that thing. Great. Let's go to the handset makers and say, we want to make something like this. It won't be the mm. Edge, but it mm. will be an Ubuntu phone. Cool. Okay. Well, that's a lot of Edge stuff. Let's talk about some events. Laura, what's the first event? HBMC Hubfest. XBMC. X, yeah. I read it and it came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's on the 24th of August in Southampton. What yeah. is it? Yeah, so XBMC is what, Alan? Uh, it's a uh, media player. It's been around for years. It was um, originally called Xbox Media Center and ran on the original first mm. generation Xbox um, and allowed you to uh, stream and play media um, on your TV. Sort of like Myth TV. Yeah, like a like a really lean Myth TV. It didn't do recording of oh, CD yes, programs. No, it was sorry. just for yeah. playback of content and, and could display pictures and play your music. And it was like a media center. Well, given the name, that makes sense. <laughs> it was like a media center. Like a media center uh, and for your Xbox. And, uh, and so it had been ported to a few other platforms, including you can get a build for the Raspberry Pi, XBMC on the Raspberry Pi. So there's a, um, a get-together um, in Southampton for people who are interested in XBMC. Cool. 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 And next up is Campus Party. Mark? Campus Party is the 2nd to 7th of September at the O2 in London, and it's basically like a big technology geek fest. Mm. Sounds fun. In a yes. tent. In a, in a tent. tent, yes, a massive tent. Uh, there's also PyCon, UK Python conference, which is in Coventry from the 20th to the 23rd of September. Uh, as well as all the technical talks and tutorials, PyCon UK has developed a significant education track over the years, and this year there'll be a number of teachers and pupils attending. Cool. See more at PyConUK.org. Brilliant. And OgCamp, we've been talking about it a long time, uh, it seems. Is it, it happening? Is, is it, it definitely it's happening? Definitely, really definitely happening. Despite okay. a lot of silence um, from the OgCamp <laughs> organisers, uh, things are going on behind the scenes. 19th and 20th of October at uh, Liverpool John Moores University in Liverpool. Um, we are looking, starting to look for exhibitors and speakers as well. So if you would like to have a table in our kind of foyer area near the cafe and tell people about your open source project give us a shout probably the best way to get in touch is og camp on twitter um also probably. we're going to start to find uh speakers so if you have got some suggestions please let us know yes yeah, so this is this is speakers for the the scheduled track on the on the big stage so if there's someone you'd really like to see talk there let us know um if you're in touch with them already that would be fantastic yeah, let them know, yeah. let them know as well let them know to email us but um, the, the other tracks will be bar camp tracks, just like usual. You turn up on the day, you give your talk, so get yeah. something ready. A good mixture. Uh, registration for tickets will be open soon, so keep an eye on ogcamp.org for yes. that. And we'll do uh, things a bit differently this year. Ooh. Yeah, Ooh. differently. Mix magic. it up a bit. Yes, yeah, so we don't like keep people guessing or something. <laughs> Um, you, yeah. say, you say they've been quiet. We wouldn't only have started organising it this far out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yes, it's all happening. Don't worry. It's all going to be great. I'm going to be there. Uh, everybody else is going to be there. It's all going to be fun. 
<laughs> yeah. You can buy us all drinks. Yes. Come or something. Or, or something. Just, just come along and chat. Yeah. Yes. Come along and say hello. That would be nice. Yes. And uh, we hope to see you there. Cool. <laughs> That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. Join us next time when we'll be interviewing John Spriggs and Jack Weirden about Campfire Manager, reading your feedback and making your life a little bit easier with some command line love. Oh, yes. Yeah, so Campfire Manager is something else that we use at Og Camp. Yes. And we'll be yes talking all about that. And if you want to help them out with it for Og Camp, how to get involved. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting episode, I think. And uh, Alan, you look like you can say something. No, I wasn't. I was going to say goodbye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.